your Bible handy, please open it to Matthew 6. Um, we're going to read Matthew 6 from verse 25 to verse 34. A couple of you are still looking for it, so you can just submit to find that there. <clears throat> Matthew 6, 25. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not your life more important than food, and your body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, or reap, or sow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And who of you, by worry, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow was thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Let's hang on to that spot if you've got your Bibles open. Let's, let's pray. Father God, we... Uh, Thank you for your reading this morning. We thank you for this reminder of, of how futile worry really is in our lives. We ask, Lord, that you, uh, that you speak through me this morning, that my words be your words, and, and we give you the glory today in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're ending our Thanksgiving series titled Thanksgiving Notes. Again, I hope sometime uh, during this morning's service before you leave here today that you'll I'll put a note up on the, on the cross. Our, our goal for the series has been to just kind of fill that up with our, our gratitude, and, and we're well on our way. We're well on our way to making that happen. So, so make sure to, to jot down something that you're thankful for. I want to post the notes and stick it up on the cross before you leave. Um, I'm going to just give us a little recap of the series so far. Uh, we started out looking at contentment. Uh, we as Americans may be one of the richest countries in the world. We may be some of the wealthiest people in the world. I know it doesn't feel like it, especially when we look around to our neighbors and friends, but, but we may be some of the wealthiest people in the world. And we mentioned that first week, that, that, that over half of the people in the world don't make $2 a, a day. Um, that's extreme poverty. So many people today live in such extreme poverty. And, and yet we, uh, are, are, we have so much more than so many others do. Uh, but, but we aren't real content with it, are we? Uh, we kind of lack that contentment. But we saw in that first week that Paul learned that the secret to contentment was in the knowledge that all we really need is Christ. That if we have Jesus Christ, we really do have all we really need. And, and, and we learned that the secret was in knowing that, that I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And that's Philippians 4.13. And, and we saw the contemporary English version of that, which, which I really liked. Christ gives me the strength to face anything. Christ gives me the strength to face anything. I like that. Uh, last week we looked at envy. And, and while we might not think that envy is, is one of those big sins, it's just one of those little things. Everybody does it, so it can't be all that bad, right? Um, but we saw that there's no such thing. As a little sin that doesn't mean anything. Every sin separates us from God. There's no such thing as, as a little sin. Yet our lack of contentment and our envy are, are both sins. And both of those can serve to separate us from God. Um, we saw that Asaph was struggling with envy. And that he almost slipped. He almost lost his foothold. He almost got lost in his sin. Uh, but then he made his way by the end of the psalm. He, he made his way back to worshiping God. And that's the key for us if, if we find ourselves facing a little sin is to get back to worshiping God. And, and worshiping God will lift us out of that sin. This week we're going to look at worry. 
And that's another one of those things that, that we know we shouldn't be worrying. We know we shouldn't be anxious about every little thing. But it's so hard, right? And then, of course, we look at everybody else, and everybody else is worrying. Everybody else is anxious, too. Um, I think these three things, lack of contentment, envy, and worry, are three little sins that most of us don't even think about. But yet, they can separate us from God. And they can rob us of our thankfulness and our gratitude. And that's why we're looking at these three in our series on, on thankfulness. So let's jump into our reading so we can get a better understanding of, of where we are here and what Jesus is really trying to tell us what to do. First, I'd like to stop and take a look at where we are. Who is it that's speaking? Who is he speaking to? And, and where is this taking place? And, and first, we know that Jesus is speaking here, right? Um, Matthew 6 is part of the Sermon on the Mount. So um, we don't know exactly where they are, but, but I think it's safe to say they're somewhere in Galilee, somewhere near the Sea of Galilee, though not necessarily on the shore, probably not on the shore. In fact, if you've got your Bibles open, take a look, uh, flip back just a page or two to uh, Matthew 4, and you see in verse, uh, verse 18... As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. So he's walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee. So he's in Galilee at the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Verse, uh, the next verse, verse 19, he calls Simon and Peter to come follow me. Um, and then uh, two verses later, he comes across the brothers James and John in verse 21, and he calls them to follow him as well. So he's at the shore. But then in verse 23 it says, Jesus then went throughout, throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. So he's not at the shore anymore, but he's still somewhere in Galilee. He's going around Galilee, teaching people, healing people, um, telling them about the kingdom of God. So he's somewhere in, in Galilee. Who's he talking to? Well, we know the disciples were there, but he also, it says in chapter 4, verse 25, it says that um, large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, now the Decapolis is a group of 10 cities south of the Sea of Galilee, it's still in Galilee, but south of the Sea of Galilee, from Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan. So those are the people, large crowds of people following him, from all around Galilee, from the region south of, of the Sea of Galilee, from Jerusalem, Judea, and even from the other side of the Jordan. Um, so these are the people that are following him. Uh, and that's when, he, uh, that's when he started teaching. Chapter 5 begins, Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. So he's not just teaching the disciples. He's teaching those large crowds as well. And he's sitting on the side of the mountain, so, so he's higher than they are. They can see him better. They can hear him better. Um, and, and that's when he begins teaching. And that's the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount goes from chapter 5, 6, and 7. All of chapter 5 through 7 are, are in the setting. Now, and we know this was very early in Jesus' public ministry. Chapter 3 covers the baptism of Jesus. Chapter 4 covers the, uh, the 40 days fasting in the wilderness, the temptation, and then at the very end of chapter 4, we see the calling of the first disciples. Uh, and then chapter 5 is, is the Sermon on the Mount. So it's very early in his ministry. And we know that already, very early in his ministry, he's got large crowds following him, listening and watching, even from the very beginning. So to get a feel for who we are, who we are where we are, and, and who we're talking about, uh, Jesus had just called his first disciples. He, he heals some people in Galilee. He's teaching, and the crowds are starting to follow him. They become so great, and he goes up on a mountainside and begins to teach. Um, now, now, he teaches in, in the Sermon on the Mount. He talks about a lot of different topics. This morning, we're going to look at the topic of worry, and what Jesus has to teach us about worry. Because as we work through these, I think we'll find that God can, uh, can really take hold of us and, 
And as we take care of those little sins, that lack of contentment, envy, worry, as Jesus takes care of those things in our lives, our thankfulness and gratitude can be restored. So let's look at what Jesus tells us about worry. Back to chapter 6, verse 25. And what does he tell us? It's really very simple. He says, do not worry about your life. He tells us, don't do it. What's he tell us about worry? Don't. Don't go there. Don't worry about things. We do, don't we? We all do. Jesus says, don't. Remember what Rick Warren says in Purpose Driven Life about worry? He says, worry is like a rocking chair. It gives us something to do, but it doesn't get us anywhere. That's true, isn't it? That's true. You can't solve a single problem in your life by worrying about it. Not one thing. Worry makes us anxious. In fact, that's why we worry, right? We're anxious because there's nothing we can do about a particular situation. So we get worked up over it. We get worried about it. And it causes us to be very, very anxious about it. But worry isn't productive. Worry can't actually accomplish anything. And Jesus even tells us in verse 27, he said, Who of you by worry can add a single hour to his life? Nobody, right? We can't add any time to our life. We can't accomplish anything by worrying. It's kind of interesting in that verse that some of our translations have a, a bit different wording. For example, King James Version and, and Holman Christian Standard Bible use the phrase, uh, Cuban, who of you... Um, the Holman Christian Standard Bible says, can any of you add a single cubit to his height by worrying? It's a little bit different, isn't it? We're doing a little bit different. Um, it's actually a little bit truer to the Greek. The Greek word that's used there refers to a length. Uh, it's a measurement of length, not a measurement of time. So I don't know where we got the adding an hour to your life. It's not really what the Greek word is referring to. Uh, but so So it's Probably a minor error there somewhere along the line. Uh, but it's a pretty new point, isn't it? It doesn't matter if we're talking about growing taller or living longer. Worrying isn't going to help us accomplish either one. Uh, so the answer to Jesus' question, whichever question it was, is that no one can, can add uh, a cubit to their height or, or an hour to their, to their days. Um, it's a rather new point. It's a rhetorical question. And, and, and it, it reminds us that there's absolutely no benefit to worry. It won't accomplish anything. In, in fact, science has taught us that there's a number of very negative consequences to worry and anxiety. Um, so not only does it accomplish anything positive, it can accomplish some very negative things. We know that anxiety can cause sleeping issues. It can cause headaches, muscle tension, exhaustion, irritability. Anxiety um, has been shown to contribute to heart disease and, and irritability uh, and, and depression and a host of other serious issues. So anxiety is a dangerous thing. Worry is, is a negative thing. Worry is not something we should be doing. There's no positive to it, but there are some, some heavy negatives. Yet we all do it, don't we? We all do it. I want to remind you of the story of Mary and Martha. Um, if you've got your Bibles open, flip back to Luke, uh, Luke chapter 10, and just watch, look at that with me, Luke chapter 10. We're going to start at verse 38, Luke chapter 10. It starts out by saying, As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. So, so we get the scenario. We know from other passages that, that Martha lives in Bethany. That's the name of the village. Luke doesn't actually name it, but other gospel writers do. Um, Martha is in Bethany. Jesus and his disciples are traveling through. They pass through Bethany, and, and they go to Martha's house. Um, verse 39 she had a sister called Mary 
who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. So, so Martha wasn't sitting in the room with the rest of them, but Mary was. Mary was very interested in everything that Jesus had to say. And, and almost from, from the time that, uh, that Jesus sat down, Mary sat down with him. Probably at his feet. That's kind of the image we get, right? Um, that, that Mary was uh, sitting in front of him, listening intently to everything he had to say. That was kind of a way of showing honor and respect to somebody, sitting at their feet, listening to them. Uh, and I'm sure she expected to get some very good teaching from Jesus as he was recounting some of the travels that he'd been going on, some of the things that he did. Uh, you know the story? You know that that drove Martha a little bit crazy? Verse 40. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. So Martha wasn't sitting in the room with them. Uh, Martha was in the kitchen preparing a meal. Maybe she was cleaning the house. Um, remember that Jesus and his disciples, there's 12 of them, so that's a minimum of 13 people just stopped by relatively unannounced for dinner, right? Um, how many of you would freak out if 13 people knocked at your door and said, I'd like to have dinner here? Um, not to mention the crowds that often followed him, who knows that there were other friends of the family that Jesus picked up along the way. There could have been as many as 20 people or more just knocking on the door, hey, we want to have dinner with you. Um, just stopping by somewhat unannounced for dinner. So there's a lot of things to be done, right? You've got to straighten up the house. You've got to uh, figure out the meal. You've got to wait on your gas, probably put out some snacks, get some beverages ready, kind of get you anything to drink, that kind of thing. There's a lot to be done to take care of that many people stopping by. At this point, many of you might be siding with Martha, right? I, I can understand her plight. Why isn't she, why isn't she helping? Why is Martha left to do it all? Um, after all, if Mary could get up and help her, maybe she could be done sooner, and both of them would have an opportunity to sit with Jesus and enjoy his presence, right? But here's the thing. While you and I might be tempted to agree with Martha, Jesus didn't. And we get a clue of this from the word that was used to describe what Martha was doing. Did you catch it? It said Martha was distracted. Martha was distracted. See, there's no better place for us to be than at the feet of Jesus. Amen. No better place for us to be. We all need to make sure that we can spend as much time as we can at the feet of Jesus. So how do we do that? Well, we can read, we can study, we can think about Jesus, we can focus on Jesus. Even when we're working, Paul talked about working as if you're working for the Lord, not for man. If we keep our focus on Jesus all the time, we can be sitting at the feet of Jesus all the time. We might even take this passage to the extreme and say that if you're not sitting at the feet of Jesus, you're distracted by something else. Something that's not Jesus. As much as possible, we should try to spend every minute of every day at the feet of Jesus. Anything else you do is a distraction that keeps you from what you should be doing. And that was the lesson here, isn't it? So Martha comes to Jesus and she wants to try to get Mary to help. She says, she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister's left me to do all this work by myself? Tell her to help me. She's grumbling and complaining about having to do all the work. And, and I get it. We get it, right? We understand that. We, we, we can put ourselves in that situation. Doesn't sound fair. But here's the thing. She's distracted by something that's not Jesus. And she wants Jesus to tell her sister to be distracted by it too. You think that's going to work? Not going to happen, is it? Jesus said, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you were worried and upset about many things, but only one is needed. What's needed? Spending time with the of Jesus is needed. That's the most important thing. Everything else is distracting us. What's needed 
is to spend time with Jesus. Martha was worried about a lot of different things. And worry has caused her to be distracted. Now, there's a thing in that verse. You were worried and upset about many things. How many of us this morning are worried or upset about many things? A lot of us are, aren't we? A lot of us are. And when that happens, maybe it's because we've allowed ourselves to get distracted from that which is most important. Don't let worry cause you to be distracted. Continuing on, Jesus closes this by saying, um, Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Whatever you're doing, spending time with Jesus is better. Let's go back to Matthew. If you follow me along, jump back to Matthew 6 again. And we're going to start here with, um, with verse 26. But Jesus gives us two examples on things that we tend to worry about that we shouldn't worry about. He talks about food, and he talks about clothing. What, what are we going to eat? What are we going to wear? Now, Jesus' lesson obviously goes well beyond what we're going to eat and what we're going to wear. But let's jump in here and see what he actually says. Verse 26. Um, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stole away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Your Heavenly Father feeds them. We worry about where our food is going to come from. But our Heavenly Father is going to feed. He's going to feed us, right? God feeds his creation. Psalm uh, 104, verse 21 says, The lions roar for their prey. The lions roar for their prey and seek their food from God. God feeds his creation. Psalm 145, verse 15 says, The eyes of all look to you. And not just mankind, the eyes of all creation look to God. And you give them their food at the proper time. So the birds of the air, along with all creation, looks to God, to the Heavenly Father, for their provision. Next verse. Are you not much more important than they are? Much more valuable than they are? I get totally lost. I went too far there. Yeah. Mankind is made in the image of God. We are more important than the birds, right? Because we're made in God's very image. We're image bearers, if you will. Birds can't say that. We really are more valuable to God than the birds are. Because God made us in his image. Matthew 10, and again, if you're following along in your Bible, it's just a page or two back. Matthew 10, verse 29, says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. Sparrows are pretty worthless. More or less worthless. But yet, God controls them. He provides for them. He watches over them. He keeps them in his hands. God is in complete control. They're coming and going. He provides food for them and, 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 and watches over them uh, until their time has come. But we're worth much more than sparrows are. Verse 31 says, Do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. The lesson is that if God will do that for sparrows, that you can buy two cents, two for a penny, certainly he's going to do that and so much more for you. <coughs> Don't worry. God's got you. Whatever your worry is about, God's got you. And then back to our reading, Matthew 6, verse 28. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not, uh, they do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all his glory and splendor, was dressed like one of these. We talked about Solomon, I 
was it a couple of weeks ago, or was it the last series? But we talked about Solomon being one of the richest men who ever lived on, on the earth, on, on the planet. First king said he was the wealthiest king that ever lived. But even to today, some project his wealth was in today's dollars at $2.1 trillion. $2.1 trillion. One person worth $2.1 trillion. Wow. Elon Musk, the wealthiest man in America, is worth $350 billion, just under $350 billion. Um, and that's a lot of money. But how much more is $2.1 trillion? Even Solomon, wealthiest man probably who ever lived, never looked as good as the flowers of the field. Lost my way again. Not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? And then here's the, here's the key to that. If you're following along, Say the next five words with me. This is the key to why we worry. Oh, you of little faith. Oh, you of little faith. If, if we trust in God to take care of our needs, then why do we worry? It's our lack of faith, isn't it? Why do we worry? Because we are people of little faith. 1 John 4.18 tells us there is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. When you have faith in God, and when you love God, God pours out his love on you, and, and his perfect love drives out that fear. His love drives away all those things we might worry about, the, the worry, the concern in our lives. We can trust him. God's got you. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity. That's what the NIV says. A lot of translations use the word fear. God does not give you a spirit of fear, but of strength and love and of self-discipline. We don't have to fear anything because the Holy Spirit is with us. And the Holy Spirit takes away our fear and gives us power and love and self-discipline. Back to our reading, verse 32. For the pagans run after these things. Who are the pagans? They're the unbelievers, right? They're those who don't have that faith. They're the ones who don't have the Spirit of God coming on them, taking away worry and fear, uh, and giving them power and love. Uh, the New Living Testament calls them unbelievers. The East, uh, English Standard Bible calls them Gentiles. The Holman Christian Standard Bible calls them idolaters. They don't believe. They don't have that walk with Christ. They don't have faith. They're the ones that are worrying. They're chasing after all these things because they're worrying. But you shouldn't be worried because you know God. You know that God will take care of you. God's got you. Verse 33, and I've quoted this one the first week of our study. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given you as well. What things? The food, the shelter, the clothing, those things that we might worry about. God will provide for us. Isn't that what Mary was doing? Isn't that kind of like sitting at the feet of Jesus? Seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness? Just following and trusting Christ in everything. Last verse. Uh, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Contemporary English version translates that. Don't worry about tomorrow. It will take care of itself. You have enough to worry about. So what is it that we have to worry about? We have to worry about spending our time with the fear of Jesus. We have to worry about chasing after Jesus' uh, kingdom and his righteousness. The rest will take care of itself. Let's, let's close with prayer. We'll have the praise team come up. 
And then we have a, a, a great, exciting privilege today. We're going to invite a few uh, to join us in, in fellowship, join our church family today. Uh, so they'll come up during the singing of our, of our last song here. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your grace, for your spirit, for your power uh, that is made real inside of us, that, that is felt within us, that is um, powering us through life. We don't have to worry about anything anymore. Because we can trust in you. We can trust that you've got this for us. And, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.